few verses in Galatians 6. And, and to be honest, I've gone back and forth on whether to preach on this, but I felt God really speak to me about preaching from these verses this morning. Um, and, and some of it's going to be quite hard hitting, so I'll just prepare you in advance. But I feel this is the right thing to look at this morning. You'll see probably almost as soon as we start to read. So Galatians 6, 7 to 10. Do not be deceived. God cannot be mocked. A man reaps what he sows. Whoever sows to please their flesh, from their flesh will reap destruction. Whoever sows to please the Spirit, from the Spirit will reap eternal life. Let us not become weary in doing good, for at the proper time you will reap a harvest if you do not give up. Or some translations go with, if you do not lose heart. Therefore, as we have opportunity... Let us do good to all people, especially to those who belong to the family of believers. So simple verses. I imagine many of us will have heard at least some of these verses before. They'll sound familiar to us. Two simple points this morning. Number one, we reap what we sow. If you plant wheat, you don't get strawberries. If you plant tomatoes, you don't get pineapples. Like, it's just not what happens. Or to bring it into kind of more into life examples, I'll give you two examples that are kind of loosely based on real events. Uh, One day I'm alone in the kitchen, and I suddenly have the thought, oh, there's some celebration chocolates in the cupboard. I'll just have one of them. Take one, go back down to my desk. My desk is in the basement, so you have to go back down to it. Uh, sitting at my desk, finish the chocolate, immediately have the thought, maybe I could just have one more. So I go back upstairs, help myself to another one. A few minutes later, back down at my desk again, maybe just one more. Still, <laughs> you can, like, I won't go through the whole process until like 20 minutes later, the celebration tin has now just got bounties left in it and <laughs> nothing else left. You reap what you sow. And Another example, we're watching something on Netflix one night evening. We've just watched a couple of episodes. It's gone half nine, so way past our bedtime. Um, (laughs) I joke, but, you know, (laughs) it's about what we can handle these days. Um, But we're really into the show, so I'm going to blame this one on Jude. So Jude says, can we just watch one more before we go to bed? And I'm like, oh, okay, Ben, if we have to, if you insist. And... We don't actually just end up watching one more, we watch several more, and then we end up going to bed way too late. And in reality, neither of these things are wrong at all in themselves, but you keep repeating them, and it has negative consequences. Like, you reap what you sow. You eat badly, uh, you don't end up with a beautifully toned body. I'm not showing you my body as an example, (laughs) it's beautifully toned. (laughs) You eat well, you end up with this. Um... No. Uh, You eat badly, you don't end up with a beautifully toned body. You don't grow to become the person you want to be by consuming lots of maybe perfectly innocent but pointless TV. It doesn't happen. You don't grow into the person you're meant to be. You don't grow as a Christian in a general sense by feeding yourself, by consuming continually what the world has to offer. It just doesn't happen. We reap what we sow. So two fields we can sow in that this passage puts us across, we can sow into the flesh or the spirit. Now, this is where it starts to really hit quite hard. The flesh, that's our lower nature with its selfish, ungodly desires and passions. And the, the late, great church leader and commentator, John Stott, says this, and you need to brace yourself for this because it's pretty hard hitting. To sow into the flesh is to pander to it, cosset it, cuddle and stroke it instead of crucifying it. The seeds we sow are largely thoughts and deeds. Every time we allow our mind to harbor a grudge, entertain an impure fantasy, or wallow in self-pity, we are sowing in the flesh. And he goes on, and a bit later he says, Some Christians sow to the flesh every day and wonder why they don't, do not reap holiness. Holiness is a harvest. Whether we reap it or not depends almost entirely on what and where we sow. So crucifying it is putting to death things. It is brutal, but utterly vital part if we want to grow as disciples of Jesus. The spirit then is, 
is similar to where elsewhere Paul will talk about walking with the Spirit or setting our minds on the things of the Spirit. So every time we're generous, every time we show courage for God, every time we're kind, every time we depend and rely on God rather than ourselves, every time we're selfless, we're sowing into that field of the Spirit. And interestingly, the famous fruit of the Spirit is just before this bit in Galatians 5. So sowing into the field of the Spirit produces fruit of the Spirit, you could say. So sowing in the Spirit reaps holiness and eternal life. John Stott again puts it, communion with God, which is eternal life, will develop now until in eternity it becomes perfect. So it's important to be really clear at this point, like before we all start feeling really guilty, because the reality is all of us are imperfect, and all of us will sow towards the flesh at times rather than the Spirit. This isn't something that we can earn. This isn't about working our way to relationship with God. The point isn't that we need to work harder, clean up our acts, become more acceptable before God. No, the, we're all hopelessly lost without Jesus. In fact, it's impossible for us to sow into the field of the Spirit without Jesus. But then with Jesus, it becomes possible. It's all different. He was crucified for our sin, our shame, our guilt, taking it to the cross with him. And so that anyone who comes to Jesus is accepted and loved, not based on performance, but 100% based on Jesus. It's all his grace and love. So we can crucify any area where we might be sowing in the field of flesh, like holding on to a grudge, having thoughts that we shouldn't have about other people, in actions as well. We can deal with these things and choose to sow in the field of the Spirit instead because of His grace, because we have been set free, because He has given us a freedom that makes what was impossible possible, because we are different, because we are loved, because we are His children. So many things in life that we can't control, but if you're a follower of Jesus, you always have the choice to choose which field you're going to sow into. That is completely within our control because of what Jesus has done. Not because we're special, not because we're better, and we won't always make the right choice, but it is always possible by the power of Jesus, by the power of the Spirit that he gives us as well, working within us, to always choose to sow into the field of the Spirit rather than the field of the flesh. You know, during the last year or so, I've, I've been quite ill at times, as already been mentioned this morning, spent a lot of time in hospital, and people have been really kind to me throughout that, which I'm really grateful for. And, and one thing that was often said to me was, Dave, you really need to be kind to yourself. And I'm not knocking that because... It was, it was a kind comment and ma- meant really kind. And I think they were completely right when it came to being kind to myself physically, maybe even emotionally because of all I've been through. But in reality, when it came to my spiritual life, I found I've needed to be absolutely brutal with myself. I've had so many reasons why I could get annoyed at God, why I could get annoyed at other people, why I could be disappointed about things I've missed about, why I could get bitter. And, and like, to be honest... I've had to work through that. It's not like I'm different to anyone else and can somehow deal with that perfectly. No, I've had to fight in my inner world to deal with those things, and I am still fighting now. I found it far harder than I ever thought. I missed Christmas this year. I spent two weeks in hospital over Christmas. And uh, to be honest, with that one, I'd found my actual health stuff harder at some of my previous hospital visits. But what I found really hard there was missing one of very few Christmases while our children are still young. And it hit me far, far harder than I thought. And I've had to work really hard, and still now, to be honest, dealing with the disappointment of that. And trying to not let that disappointment become something else. I've had to grieve it, lament the loss in my heart before God. You see, there's a battle raging over your life, and the the enemy would love nothing more for you to be continually sowing into the wrong field. And some of the versions of sowing into the wrong field are the kind of things where no one else will know, or at least not initially. (laughs) Longer term, if you keep doing it, it will come out and become obvious to all. It's important to see that we don't grow in this by trying harder. It's all about relationship with God. It's all about growing closer to Him, learning to hear His voice, 
And not just hear his voice, because hearing his voice is just step one. Then choosing to obey his voice and sow into the right field. So whenever the good news of Jesus slips from view in our lives, we quickly move to more performance-based thinking, which is why I've continually, around making these points, tried to bring us back to Jesus and his cross and his death and his resurrection and what he's achieved. That is where this is won. Not, I'm not going to do that, I'm not going to do that, I'm not going to do that. It's won by looking to Jesus, and it's won by deliberately and intentionally sowing into the field of the Spirit instead. It's no good to just not do something. You have to choose to sow into the right field instead because you're going to sow into one or the other. So are you sowing into the right fields? To be honest, as I ask that question, I realize for most of us that's probably a much more complex answer than just yes or no. (laughs) For most of us, it'll be, yeah, mainly, but there's this bit over here (laughs) that I need to look at. This isn't a zero effort on our thing kind of part. It's not like... God comes and takes over and does it for us. Yes, he wins our salvation for us. We cannot contribute to that in the slightest. But there is effort required on our parts to keep sowing into the right fields. And when we sow into the right fields, we reap a harvest that leads to holiness. We reap a harvest that leads to seeing the benefit of the fruit of the Spirit in our lives now as we grow in love and joy and peace and patience and kindness and self-control. And one day, we'll reap the full harvest of that as we're with Jesus in person. Secondly, let's not become weary in doing good. So we read, let's not become weary in doing good, for at the proper time you'll reap a harvest if you do not give up. Or as we said before, some translations say, if we do not lose heart. Therefore, as we have opportunity, let's do good to all people especially those who belong to the family of believers. So next Sunday, we're going to deliberately look at our vision together as a church, what we feel God's calling us to do as a church family, uh, within our church family, and our love for the city and beyond. But they say that charity starts at home. So yes, we're meant to love our neighbors. Yes, we're meant to love our city. We're meant to even love our enemies and do good to all people. But reality is that's like... Pointless going there if we can't actually first love one another. And again, I want to say we're delighted by what we're seeing with that in this church family. And to help us do that, we've talked about the culture of honor, courage, and generosity already this morning. So we're so encouraged where we've got to, but it's really important as we get to this point that we fight to grow and maintain these things. As we love and do good to one another, Yes, it's never meant to stop there, but it really does have to start there. (laughs) It's no good for us to go and try and love our city if we aren't loving one another. So we must not grow weary. It feels like we're doing really well, church, and we must keep going for it. And you know what? To grow grow weary is a really interesting one because active Christian service, planting churches, pioneering grounds, doing church in rented venues, moving venues... None of it is easy. It's tiring. And we faced other setbacks as well. And we've, we've experienced plenty of setbacks, but also much to celebrate, as we've kind of illustrated in this morning. But you know what? Rarely do I find when people pull back from active Christian service that they flourish in their life in God as a result. I can think of very few examples where people have pulled back from doing things for God and as a result grown in their relationship with God. And it, to do that kind of, I guess, pushes against the sentiment in the verse here. Do not grow weary in doing good. You see, the problem is, I think what happens sometimes is, don't get me wrong, it's entirely right that sometimes people are doing too much and they need to do a bit less. I'm talking about where people like withdraw <laughs> from everything, not going, oh, I'm juggling too much, I can't quite fit it all in. I think the problem is, when we grow weary, we can think that we need more me time, <laughs> But the answer to weariness is never found in more time for us. There is no answer there that will satisfy your soul whatsoever. The answer when we grow weary is really simple. We're told to get to Jesus. I was once wisely told, if you're tired, go to bed. If you're weary, go to God. It's quite simple, really. (laughs) We make life far too complicated at times. 
I feel like following that principle solves an awful lot of problems in life. If you're physically tired, get more sleep. If you're weary, you've got to get to God. And I think getting weary isn't the problem. Like even for me in this last week, I think I came back from Catalyst, really delighted, really excited by Catalyst. Came back by like 11 o'clock Tuesday morning as I got back to work. I was already feeling pretty weary, pretty like, oh man, so much to do. Like I don't know what to do about this, don't know what to do about this. Um, and like by Thursday morning, I was really in need of getting to God. And I had to set aside some extra time to get to God, like hand over my burdens to him. Not just a quick, quiet time, but actually intentionally go, God, I need you to take this burden off me. I'm anxious about this. I'm worried about this. And there needs to be an intentionality when we get weary to getting to God. It can't just be a tick box exercise. It's not like some kind of magic trick. Oh, I've read my Bible for five minutes. I'm fine. You've actually got to get to God and pour out your heart before him. We all get weary at times. Getting weary isn't wrong. It's what we do when that happens. And Jesus says, come to me, all who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. It's simple. We come to Jesus. I know it can be really hard to do that at points. That can be really difficult and a really challenge to make that happen. But there is no other answer. <laughs> there is no other way about it. There is no other magic fix. If we're weary, we have to get to Jesus. And the danger of getting weary isn't getting weary. It's leaving it too long so that we lose heart or give up. That's what this passage says. It's that we leave it too long and we give up. So the problem isn't really about stopping doing good. It's not about a need. So, like, so often I see people like withdraw from serving other Christians because uh, they've got weary. And I'm like, the answer isn't there. The answer is you've got to get to Jesus. We're told to carry on doing good, but we need to get to Jesus at the same time. I caveat this by saying, like, I'm not calling people to burn themselves out by serving in too many areas of church. Like, that's not the point I'm making. The point I'm making is the answer is never found in stopping doing good. The answer is always found in Jesus. Paul doesn't exactly say what the harvest is here, but we know elsewhere in the Bible, harvest is used of salvations, of many people coming to faith. And we know from prophetic words over us as a church family that we're believing for many people to come to know Jesus in this city together. So we have much to celebrate, Emmanuel. We've seen some people come to faith. We've made some ground in seeing the kind of church family that we believe God wants us to be together. But really, it's only just getting started. And that's why I felt God speak to me about talking about this this morning. This is a serious thing that we're part of. God's kingdom is expanding all around the world. And he calls us to play a privileged part within it. Our little part in it here in Sheffield. What an honor. What a privilege. And then we all have a responsibility. And I imagine that for different ones of us, one or other of these points will really stand out. Or, or maybe both. We all have a responsibility to think about where we're sowing because we reap what we sow. And actually, we're all one body together. So don't go thinking that that thing you're doing over there that no one else knows about isn't going to affect the rest. It does, even if no one ever finds out about it. That's how it works in the spiritual world. And in terms of getting weary in doing good, we must commit together. That we won't let that happen in our hearts, but we'll keep getting to Jesus and keep bringing our burdens to him. And these things are crucial, really. If we want to see an Emmanuel where lots of people are encountering God's life-transforming presence, knowing his peace and flourishing in his purposes, if we want to see our city impacted for Jesus, the fight starts at home. <laughs> the fight starts in that inner world. And being brave enough to take it on in our own hearts. Because you can't fake it. If we really want to be good news for the city, Jesus' good news has to be working in our own hearts and lives. So Jesus, by the Holy Spirit, gives us everything that we need to sow into the field of the Spirit every time. And we'll reap a harvest, ultimately of eternal life, but even now of fruit in our lives and a harvest of holiness and a deep relationship with Jesus. And also, we don't deal with any weariness in our lives by anything else other than getting to Jesus. 
Holidays are great, but it won't fix weariness unless you go and intentionally meet with Jesus. That's where the answer's found. He's the one who can take our burdens.